Okay, welcome very, very much to Conversations. A distinct personal honor and privilege on my part to be able to introduce two gentlemen of long-standing friendship with me and with the world. And on my far left, I'd like to say, is um, maestro Joseph Eager. He's a musical director and conductor of the Symphony for the United Nations, abbreviated SUN. And he's also the author of a uh, book uh, called Einstein's uh, Violin. And Joseph, welcome very, very much, Maestro. Thank very welcome. You. We're going to show a clip of him conducting an orchestra uh, later in the program. And on my immediate left is, an imme is a dear friend of mine that I'm so happy has been able to get here to the set in this holiday season of 2010, almost the end of it. But that's Dr. Harry Lerner. He was a long time, he's emeritus president of the Communications Coordination Committee for the United Nations, or CCCUM, which we're going to be talking about because, as I understand it, and I think others would, it's the oldest uh, NGO in support of the United Nations that was started almost after its inception by, I think, Margaret Mead and Buckminster Fuller. And he's the emeritus president of that that carried the ball for so many years. It's an honor, sir, Harry, to welcome you to the program. May I say thank you and also to correct one of your conclusions? Yes. That Ruth Steinkraus Cohen was the founder, and uh, she was a friend of Margaret Mead. Uh -huh. And she also worked for... Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, shortly uh, after World War II. Oh, really? I remember her. She lived in Connecticut. Oh. She lived in Connecticut. She lived in Connecticut. That UN day. That yes, and she was the first. Lady, yeah. She was the first director, or uh, maybe even president. I don't know if they use that. Yeah. And I was uh, her associate. Uh huh and then became the president for 22 years. Yes, sir. You did so well at the helm. It was Captain, Captain Lerner <laughs> at the helm, and that was very good. It was very good. I do think Margaret Mead, as she was doing that, she was a famous, uh, but she was often having Bucky Fuller in tow with her as she mm -hmm. went about telling him to not talk so much, if I'm not mistaken. But I think he was in support of the United Nations as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And it goes back to uh, almost after the inception of the United Nations itself, right? Yes. And it was, was it not, if I'm right, it, it, was, the, it was thought of as the Speaker's Bureau for the United Nations at the inception? Or maybe you could share a little of the beginning. When did it get started, if you can remember the year and that sort of thing? No, I don't remember. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe 47 or something, or 48? It was a little before my time. A little before your time. Good for you. Anyway, that, that's a, that is my understanding of it. And, and, and um, Joseph, Maestro Joseph Eager, Eager is uh, been in support of it for quite a while, too. The CCC, among other things, you've been in support of that, uh, overseeing it and, con and contributing to it. Right, huh? Yes, I'm currently the emeritus chairman because I was chairman for many, many years. With Harry as president. With Harry, and Harry, in fact, pulled me into the CCC. Uh -huh. uh, he came to me when I was conducting a concert at, at a church on Park Avenue. I remember that, Harry. Uh, and Harry approached me and said, would you like to join this organization? As he was wont to do with people. That's to right. approach him and say, let's get interested in this United Nations. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I had been involved with the United Nations even prior to that. Mm -hmm. But uh, the CCC sounded like an interesting organization because it had to do with communication. Yeah. And as a musician, uh, most of my life, uh, that's what we do. We communicate. Yeah, that's right. You sure do. Music. I got a friend, Ornette Coleman. Do you know the... I know Ornette, Ornette, yes. You know Ornette, do you? I know Ornette. He won the Pulitzer. Did you know I he know won that. the Pulitzer? I know that. It's wonderful. Only two people of Jasmine have won the Pulitzer, he and uh, Winston Marcellus. And he lives... Uh, he's a... Dear friend, and he, he said to me when he lives in our building, and he's a great guy, mm -hmm. and he said he thought music might have been discovered before language. 
I don't know. It's a project, a conjecture, you know. Well, it depends on how you define music Perhaps, and how you define yeah. language. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in the definition That's of terms. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. They're both forms of communication. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. Yeah, yeah. And the United Nations is a worthy organization and one that should be supported. Well, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, it has its problems. Mm -hmm. And I've been uh, frustrated from time to time, frustrated largely because of the structure of the United Nations itself, mm -hmm. where you have the General Assembly and the Security Council. Mm -hmm. And the Security Council has a lot of talk mm -hmm. and representation of, of countries, but no teeth. And the Security Council is the part of the organizations that makes decisions. And unfortunately, the uh, Security Council has been largely run by the United States. Yes. Not always for the benefit of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and yet the, the United Nations has done wonderful things and is still doing so. Mm -hmm. So we support it and we try to improve it. Mm -hmm. Uh, we NGOs, mm -hmm. non-governmental organizations. The, 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 the United Nations is made up largely of uh, appointees okay. from governments. Uh -huh. And heads of governments, as some of us know, are not always honest yeah. and decent. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a lot of corruption in governments in the world today. Yeah. And uh, hence, uh, there's not a whole lot of representation of the people. So I was fascinated when I f first met Harry, mm. and Harry told me about his idea about having a people's assembly. So that uh, in addition to the general assembly mm -hmm. made up of appointees mm -hmm. uh, of governments, that the peoples of the world would have representation. I can remember he's been uh, with that idea for decades. He has. And needs to be applauded. Yeah. And it's not only applauded, but it's had an effect. Okay. It's spread around so that the idea of people's representation mm -hmm. in the world has grown and expanded. And has it become institution? How is it, Harry, the idea of the people's assembly? How does it stand? I know you've been fighting that fight for decades, but in your understanding, how does the the idea of a people's assembly uh, faring now, do you think? Or maybe you could share it with the audience, your idea. Uh, at this point, it's uh, in the limbo. Uh-oh, uh-huh. Um, I thought, well, Joe was describing the early stages <clears throat> that I have in front of me an article written by Dr. Abdel Kedar Abadi, who had been the director of the African Division at the United Nations mm -hmm. for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, he learned about our organization and joined the organization, even though he was a staff member of the UN, and wrote an article how the NGOs won recognition as a force for UN to reckon with. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there's a good deal of information about it, uh, how it started, mm -hmm. and um, it's indicated by the fact that as a staff as a staff member, he was able to join and work with our organization. Good. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. Because I know you've been. I can go a couple decades going back with you were couple decades uh, yes. going back, I can remember doing programs at the Penta Hotel and other places where we were supporting that general thing. And I always took my hat off to you for, for taking that initiative. Yes, we had uh, the uh, Assistant Secretary General mm -hmm. of the United Nations mm -hmm. in charge of uh, communication who was a, a keynote speaker at the Penta Hotel. I remember. Yeah. And uh, we published a, a volume which is available. Yeah, it became available and you pursued that work that was really good. You know, they, they've got it all approved, Joseph, Joseph uh, and, and Harry, for the location of the Penta Hotel to build a building. It's been approved. 
It's going to be as high as the Empire State Building in Massive, mm -hmm. where at the site of the Pinto Hotel. It's going to change the landscape down there. Yeah. But Harry, I wonder maybe you could share. You're Dr. Harry um, yeah. Lerner. Could you share your own background a little bit? Born and raised and educated, because you're a medical doctor. No. No, you're you're a psychiatrist. Psycho psychologist. Psychologist. Maybe yeah. you could share a little bit of your own background. Then we'll ask Joe to do Joseph to do the same. Well, there's a quite a history. Mm -hmm. I went from working in New York City in the early 40s uh, in the garment industry uh -huh. Uh -huh. as a volunteer in the World War II, okay. established in Texas. Mm -hmm. And through a happy circumstance, was appointed the director Oh, this was before I got my doctorate, but after I got a master's at City College. Yes. Uh, I was appointed the director of a school for information education personnel at, for, at Camp Swift, Texas, near Austin, Texas. Okay, good. During the war. <clears throat> and uh, that was the only spot on the campus, so to speak, mm -hmm. in the camp, yeah. where Negro and white troops sat together. Another round of applause for Dr. Harry Lerner. Yes, yes, right. In any event, after two and a half years there, mm -hmm. running the school, mm -hmm. I was shipped to Europe. Mm -hmm. And on the way, in the Boston part of embarkation, mm -hmm was intercepted by the officer in charge of information education personnel yes. and assigned to his staff in the Boston port of embarkation. Uh -huh. I never got to Europe. Oh, you didn't get to Europe. However, mm -hmm. because of the proximity to Yale, mm -hmm. Harvard, MIT, yes, right. I was able to recruit a staff of teachers Voluntary basis. Good, yeah. Uh -huh. For uh, personnel. For personnel and communication. No. No. Uh, communication education. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to the function of the information education office. Mm -hmm. okay. Why we fight the nature of the enemy. Yes. Et cetera. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I had volunteers from the faculty of the schools. Wonderful. Come to the base. Good, yeah. And the brother. And then you, you took a doctorate? Yes, I had a where doctorate after that? after the war. Yeah, where did you do that? Columbia at University. At Columbia, in psychology? Mostly psycho social psychology. Uh huh. Was there a particular person that you liked, say Rollo May or uh, anybody I, that you I, I knew as Rollo. They say, cottoned on to? Because there's a big difference between. between B.F. Skinner and Carl Rogers, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of psychology, it's a big mm -hmm. swath of understanding human thinking and psychological, you know. I well, think you're more of an eclectic well, or a human. I, I was interested in community development. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, leadership. Uh -huh. uh, my dissertation was information education wonderful wonderful yeah it's very important community development is an important concept mm -hmm. maybe we can segue over to you maestro what about your background where is you born and drug up as i used to say in detroit or raised and your background and how you got into the uh, into the prestigious position that you have been in well it's uh <clears throat> too much for one hour yeah i understand but a brief uh, well, uh, I was raised in this country. My parents were immigrants. Mm -hmm. I, uh, there were nine children in the family. We had a big family. I was the youngest. Mm -hmm. And uh, the name of the game was survival then. Oh, boy. Uh, simply survival. And uh, uh, I, uh, early on, mm -hmm. became interested in reading. And I read some of the rebellious uh, authors of, of the previous century and the current century. Good. And it, it, it sounded good to me. It sounded like 
I, I saw so much suffering around me, Amen. in my own family and in the world, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that I, I early on decided that I, I wanted to do something about that. At, at the same time, I was discovered by some teachers uh, with musical talent, and um, I got a scholarship at the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia, which is on the par with Juilliard. Really? Yeah, Curtis? And, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, I, uh, when I got out of, I, I joined the Army in uh, the Air Force, actually, in uh, World War II. And I spent three and a half years there. It's a long time. Were you an officer? Or no, student? no. I was, uh, I was with the, uh, the, the foremost musical organization of the, uh, of the military. What was that? That was the um, uh, United Nations, United, U.S. Army Air Forces official band in oh, Washington. Okay. So we played for the presidents and generals, and then we went over toward the end of the war, we went over to Europe and uh, played for the troops there. Yeah. It was, that, that was a war that everybody, virtually everybody, wholeheartedly support. I had tried, yeah. I had tried to join the Marines, the Navy, yeah. Army, and the Air Force was turned down by all. You were. Because of my physical health and eyes and feet and so on. And I was a very sickly child. You never seemed sickly to me, sir. Well, I'm now 90 and I decided... 90? you got to be kidding. I'm Are now you 90. I decided old? very early on that I wasn't going to suffer as I saw my father suffering mm -hmm. and my uncle suffering. Mm -hmm. And I changed my way of life in terms of exercise and diet and, and outlook in general. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I learned to think that one of the things that keeps one young is having an interest and an interest is in, uh, in society. Yes, I, indeed. I truly believe that. Indeed, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, uh, after the war, I, um, I worked with Eleanor Roosevelt on human rights. Good. And as a result, I was uh, taken up by the McCarthy Committee. Yeah, you remember <laughs> put the, on the dock, yeah. And I, yeah. I was put on the dock. And, that's uh, an enemy's list you want to be on. Yes. That's right, yeah. and I, I, I was on his uh, en enemy list, in fact. Yeah. Um, I was a blacklistee, is what yeah. we were called. And it's now a badge of honor. Yes, indeed. But uh, and I was, uh, I was in there with a lot of good people like Leonard Bernstein and yes, others. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> but more recently, mm -hmm. uh, I've, uh, I'm still functioning. I conducted uh, the Beethoven Ninth Symphony in San Francisco two weeks ago uh -huh. with a large orchestra, chorus, and four splendid soloists. So I'm still functioning, and I'm. I'm, I'm preparing another book, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. and using the uh, the uh, image uh -huh. of a symphony orchestra right. as the uh, grid right. for a better society. Okay. Because in a symphony orchestra, yeah. you can only get ahead by merit, mm -hmm. not by money, and not by military pr power, right. but by merit. By merit, yeah, right. Okay, and, uh, that's good. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, Music's a great metaphor. Yeah, it, it is indeed. Yes. Uh huh. So um, that's what I'm writing about now. Mm -hmm. It's my second book. My first book was commissioned by Penguin. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't. They twisted my arm, in fact, to do it. But once I got, once they offered me a good contract and I got into it, I became very interested. Uh huh. Uh, and the name Einstein, of the book, yeah. Einstein's Violin: Why to get the A name? Conductor's Notes on Music, Physics, and Social Change. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, and I'm yeah. most proud of the last part of the book, which is on social change. Uh huh. Uh -huh. In which I outline the present conditions in the world mm -hmm. and how I think they can be changed. Mm -hmm. Good for you. That keeps you active. And so when did Einstein's violin come out? That's about 10 years ago? Or? No, about uh, six, five, six years ago. Five now. or six years ago. Yeah, yeah. It's now, now it can be purchased at Amazon. Right, yeah. And you can get it for three, four dollars. It yeah. came out at twenty seven ninety five. Yeah. And uh, I did a couple of cross-country tours very mm -hmm. successfully. Uh -huh. uh, and in bookstores and right. in colleges and universities. Right. And we're going to, during the course of this program, play a clip with you conducting. Yes. And I've seen you conduct at St. Mark's, or, or no, not St. Mark's, St. Uh, Patrick's. St. Patrick's Cathedral, yes. With the 
the whole paraphernalia, I mean, it's really beautiful. It must be a fantastic experience to conduct a symphonic orchestra. Will you have? I mean, all right. You know, and you've got, you know, it, 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 Danny Kay used to talk about how wonderful it would be to conduct, or was it Danny Kay who Danny had Kay, the dream I, of... Uh, well, Danny was a pretty good conductor. Was he really? Yeah. Uh, I was Great on the, talent, I was yeah. on the, uh, on the in, in 20th Century Fox, uh -huh. where I was doing some recording, yeah. and he came and he conducted the orchestra we did had. Did he? Uh -huh. And he did pretty well. Uh -huh. Very uh -huh. gifted guy. Yeah. But it takes a talent to be able to interpret the music. Talent. Why can't the people just play without a conductor? What does a conductor well, it's been, do? It's been attempted, yeah. and it, uh, it's, it's very difficult because the conductor, first of all, has a concept yeah. of the music, right. and second of all, keeps everybody together. Mm -hmm. Now, people can be kept together without a conductor. Right. You can have somebody knocking a cane on the floor, which they did two, 250 years ago. Is that what they used to do? But, yeah. uh, but mm -hmm. if you have a, uh, a fine conductor with a fine concept, mm -hmm. and the concept is the most important thing. The concept? The concept yeah. of the music, what right. it means, what right. it stands for. Right. Uh, well, uh, you'll see in a few minutes um, yeah. me conducting parts of the Beethoven Ninth Symphony. Yeah. Well, since then, mm -hmm. I have looked deeper, even deeper, into the music, that particular music, yeah. which is, in my opinion, one of the greatest works of all time. Yeah, right. Uh, and I think when one grows, mm -hmm. one can gain wisdom and insight. Yeah. Some people do. And I would like to think so, having grown considerable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, well, I think that the way you grow is by acting, by okay. action. Uh -huh. by acting in a societal form, right. yeah. in trying to better your fellow man. Right. And yeah. I think that makes you... I think you're right, yeah. That makes you more insightful uh -huh. and more uh, more rounded person. Uh, right. And, and active. Activity and keeping active is really... The, and doing it in the name of a good cause, not just to make money. Precisely. Which is, uh, motivates so much of human behavior, unfortunately, I have to and everything. But that's really good. Well, it would seem to me that maybe this would be, because we've got a DVD, right, mm -hmm. of you conducting. Was it the Ode to Joy, I think? That's uh, right. Yeah. And uh, recently, relatively, and maybe you could, as they say in the business, set it up for us. All right. And it's rather long in the sense of uh, television. We're going to about nine minutes or so. And it might be well in this holiday season or just ending of the holiday season and so forth to have that uh, experience. But could you set it up, let us know where it was done and the sure. context? Well, it was, and the, uh, what did you call it the conductor has? The concept? The concept, yeah. The, the concept. The idea. The, yeah. The, uh -huh. the, the meat and... And, and bones mm -hmm. of, a, of a work of music. And Beethoven, Beethoven was a rebel himself yeah. in music uh -huh. and also in society. Oh, uh, really? And the reason I called it Einstein's violin, because Einstein was a socialist. Okay. And yeah. I consider myself a socialist. Okay, yeah. In, yeah. in terms of trying to create a better society, right. a more equitable society. Right. Uh, I think most intellectuals do, don't you? Are there intellectuals that are concerned with the interests of the already rich and powerful? I guess there are some who do that other than just being sycophant to get some advantage. But I don't think a major intellectuals in what would be the right wing. Do you, the intellectuals? I mean, there are very few. Burke, maybe? Or there there are a few around. Yeah. But very few. Most intellectuals are concerned with the plight of the least among us, it seems to me. A well, the, of that intellectuals yeah. are generally interested in facts, yeah. not in lies. Okay. Oh, that's rules out a lot of the government and much of the <laughs> and, government and the corporate structure. There's yeah. a man named. Uh, there was a man named Izzy Stone. I have Stone. Oh, God bless Izzy Stone. Who said all governments lie? Yeah. Would we, could we support that also? Not only all governments. But all corporate, because we're we're taken over by a corporatocracy. The private sector isn't all that pristine, pure. Exactly. Right. right. Exactly. And uh, uh, I think that we're in lot. We're going to be in lots of trouble mm -hmm. if the corporate government co uh, co cooperation mm -hmm. continues, because by and large, with some exceptions, some wonderful, notable exceptions. Mm -hmm. 
they are locked into the bottom line, making more money. Absolutely. And yeah. making more money at the cost uh -huh. of people of the, peoples of the world, yeah. at the cost of the very planet right. on which we live. Thank you. And the weapons are species lethal now, Joseph, I do believe since about 1970. Species lethal, which is a new reality after 200,000 years That's of our right. existence. That's right, exactly. And Fuller and others projected we very well may have about the same time transcended a, an ontologic, one step removed from normal reality news, yes. but not to spiritual, but an ontologic reality where we have the ability to see that there are, in terms of capability, more haves than have-nots in terms of our capability and it's trending for the first time in 200 years. It's a, it's a major moment of qualitative transformation. It's a is point of departure in history, in human yeah. history. Yeah, yeah. Either we're unique, gonna, yeah. Either we're gonna destroy, not we, not you and me, mm -hmm. but the corporate government uh, elite. Collectively, the home is, when, when you get to where you can obliterate the entire species, mm -hmm. couldn't do it in the Second World War. We were trying, weren't we? That's right. Couldn't do it. We were impotent, mm -hmm. but we no longer are. And we're also, imp we're, we were impotent to liberate humanity in the historical condition, and we've crossed the line where that's now possible, so we've got to start talking to that level of things. Exactly, but yeah. on the other hand, yes, sir. There, I think the peoples of the world are being educated by experience, okay. not by the television, not by reading books, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but by their own experience, uh -huh. they're beginning to realize that there's something awfully wrong, yeah. and they're going to rebel. Uh -huh. so, uh, so there's a Well, let's hope we can add to that. Oh, I hope it can be a rebellion <laughs> yes. positively. Harry's been serving well that, uh, that trend and everything. But it seemed to me if we could, then that's very interesting. But why don't we give the folks a treat and let us see if we can't get that DVD of Ode to Joy being conducted by Maestro Joseph. Uh, um, Egger. Uh, Egger and everything. If we could set it up in the booth, let's do that. We're talking with Dr. Harry Lerner and Joseph Eager, uh, Eager the uh, maestro of the uh, conductor, music director of the uh, Symphony Orchestra of the United Nations Sun. So let's see if we can't set that DVD up. I guess it runs about eight or nine minutes. Yeah. And it's a good thing for the holiday season to share that with mm -hmm. the people. Indeed. So could we run that, Dean? If you could, if you have a problem, let me know. I bring you the greetings and the gratitude of the Secretary General of the United Nations and of all my colleagues of the United Nations. I would like also to express our deep gratitude to Joe Eger for having taken the initiative in 1974 to take this bold and beautiful step to create a symphony for United Nations which tonight, on the eve of the special session for disarmament, will show us the example of what human harmony can be. It is indeed the great duty of our time to create a number of harmonies which we have not yet attained. The harmony between humanity and our beautiful sacred planet the harmony between all humans, all nations, all cultures, all groups on this planet. Of all the music ever composed, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony conveys, perhaps better than any other, the message most critical to our time. Alla mention verden brude, all mankind shall be as brothers. From the very beginning of this great work, the music conveys a cosmic sweep that reminds us of our history and our potential for nobility. This concert was performed at St. Patrick's Cathedral by the Symphony for United Nations on the eve of the UN Special Session for Disarmament. Musicians from all over the world came here to play for peace. 
great artists and soloists joined together to perform under the direction of Maestro Joseph Eger, himself one of the world's great concert artists as well as a world-class conductor. The reason Beethoven is so popular, I think, is that more than any other composer, he attunes us to the deepest level of our common humanity.
symphony for the United Nations has been a source of hope to many who feel that music offers a way of reconciling people where other ways have led to failure. The great cellist Pablo Casals once said, when we share music, we are brothers and sisters. I long for the day when the peoples of the world will sit together as in one great concert hall. Wasn't that beautiful, Harry? Wasn't that beautiful? Isn't he something else? And you're so perfectly the maestro and the conducting and so forth. And you tell me that the language and the language and the words are important. What Beethoven says, he says, hmm. let us no longer have a world of sadness and suffering. Yeah. Let us create a better world. Yes. A better world of joy. Uh -huh. And he says the way to do that is to unite right. I'll mention all peoples of the world I'll mention I'll mention all As human German beings for unite shall unite uh -huh. and and uh, oh, Beethoven emphasizes the word all you may have seen at one time I throw my hand up because he emphasizes musically mm -hmm. the word I'll mention all uh -huh. human uh -huh. beings uh -huh. not so oh, mensch yeah right all right. people uh -huh. Uh -huh. and uh, the words are very significant in this work, mm -hmm. and that's why Beethoven was so inspired by the by the poetry of Schiller. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wasn't that beautiful, Harry? Lovely. Isn't that lovely? Breathtaking. Do you think Joe's a pretty good conductor? He's okay. Okay. <laughs> are you kidding? He's great. He's a maestro. That's really good. Thanks a lot for bringing that in and for all the work you've done over that. And obviously, Harry, all the work you've done, I really appreciate it. Got about 20 minutes left or so. Uh, Ode to Joy, all to mention this kind of thing. We led into that thing saying, we're... Did a program with Isaac Asimov. Did you ever know Isaac Asimov? I didn't know him yeah. personally, but did I read his him? work. I did. Yeah, Isaac Asimov was a great comprehensivist, and he said, he confirmed, this is, it's hard. 10,000 generations there's been since Homo sapien appeared. 10,000, that's a lot. And this is the defining generation. The tipping point, as the book says. Tipping point in the name of, you know, in terms of that idea. But isn't it something to have been born into the defining generation in the sense that, as we said before, all I mentioned, good, uh, but we, we ha we, 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 it's like leaving the birth canal. Yeah. Or something on the order of like punctuated equilibrium. And we're going to come into a new relationship, maybe a liberated relationship to the, to the cosmos or something. And to be born into that time is a great privilege and it's also very... Great responsibility. Responsibility, but it's also very difficult because these are the most challenging times. We can wipe out the entire species with weapons. Couldn't do that. In our time. In our time only. Yeah. Only. What do you think, Harry? Is it time for there to be some sort of new order in the world that would bring liberation rather than annihilation? What is your thought? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Words of wisdom from Dr. <laughs> Harry Lerner. Yes, this is the time. Mm -hmm. But he's been fighting so much. How long have you guys known each other, you two? You've oh, been well, colleagues uh, for quite a while, huh? Probably close to half a century. No, really? Yeah. That long? Oh, when yeah. did you first, do you remember the first time you met? Was it in a saloon? Was it in a, a, a peace march? Or how did you meet her? I Can think you it was remember? in a church. In a church. That's yeah. very good. <laughs> I was doing it on Fifth Harry Avenue Lerner. and 90th Street. On 90th Street in the city of New York. Yeah. 90th and what? Park. And uh, Fifth Avenue. 90th and 5th. I've got it fixed in my mind, yeah. 90th and 5th. We, that's when we had it. Uh, a big conference, uh -huh. and I say we, I'm trying to think of the organization, it, I think it was CIRCLE. CIRCLE, okay. Council for International Recreation, Culture, and Lifelong Education. Okay, good, really good, yeah, right, right. So that's just above the Metropolitan Museum, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not the Metropolitan. Art Museum. The Art Museum. Yeah, yeah. 
Do you remember that, Joe, or is that a Well, I, I, I remember earlier than that. Earlier than that, yeah. that you knew this fellow? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, He's got you pegged earlier in a my, saloon, I think. I think Harry. my memory may be faulty. I think Harry's oh. might, might be better. Uh -huh. But in my memory, uh -huh. I see a church on uh, Park Avenue. Oh. Yes. Um, a church in Park Avenue mm -hmm. uh, in the um, 40s or 50s. A nice church on the west side of Park. All right. But you seem to have congregated in church as young men. <laughs> Has it been, you know, saloons ever since? I'm not so sure. But, well, wish, uh, I wish we oh, had. Oh, if only, huh? Yeah. <laughs> we, we still have time, Harry. <laughs> yeah, we still have time to, yeah, right. No, that's good, but you've, been, you've both been involved in the peace activists and, and so forth, and the communication, co uh, the Committee for Coordinating the United Nations is very important, and you've held that helm for such a long time. Uh, how do you feel about the United Nations since you became interested in it in a serious way and currently? I've been out of touch for three years. Yeah, okay. But you've been in touch for 85 yeah. or something, yeah. I think it's the hope of humanity. Yeah, I, I, you concur with that? Yes. Yeah, I institutionally, that, yeah. I, however, I would make a slight modification. Uh, uh, I think that the uh, cutting up the earth in nations yeah. is obsolete. Mm -hmm. Along with a lot of other institutional assumptions that are obsolete Indeed. in terms of the future. And, yeah. and as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. uh, globalism has taken over. Yeah, corporate. Corporate, the corporation, the corporate globalism mm -hmm. has taken over. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that the United Nations can play a very, very core role mm -hmm. in changing the world. Mm -hmm. However, not until there's a more democratic United Nations wherein mm -hmm. other nations and other, other forces, people, yeah. people's forces, NGOs uh -huh. to have a larger hand uh -huh. in making decisions. Like the kind of thing Harry's been uh, uh, the pioneering, the People's Assembly is a great like idea. Assembly. A participatory democratic Exactly. Order. Yeah. And that's something you've been committed to from a long time, way back when you were very young and everything. You had this idea of a participatory democratic order, commitment to a democratic uh, society mm -hmm. and principles, right? Good for you. For all of us. Good for all of us. Good for all of us. No, but it's such great work, and he's been involved in that, and it, it continues. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what to make. Sometimes they have a hard time keeping the lights on at the UN in terms of it was a long time the United States wasn't paying anything. They, you have to have, you know, bills paid and that kind of stuff. And as you say, sovereignty is at the national level. Now, how many, there's about five, how do we define nation? That's a big issue. There's 195 countries now. They tell us that in the city of New York, there's sizable communities of about 189 of those 195 nations. New York is really a very cosmopolitan place. It's great for that reason. But how many, there's I think something on the order of, how do we define nation? How does it come about that we define the nations we, we do? Will there be new nations merging, Kashmir, other places? Well, it's order? happening before our eyes. It does seem. It used to be only 192, now it's 195. I don't know who, do you understand what I'm saying? Sure, is that? How do we come to identify the nation state as such a thing where sovereignty is to reside governmentally? And how do we get past the limitations of seeing things that way? I think by, as by asking the question, mm -hmm. I think you're answering yourself. Mm -hmm. We can ask the question, is Afghanistan today mm -hmm. a nation with a bunch of tribes? Mm -hmm. uh, India and Pakistan were created as nations. Mm -hmm. Pakistan is, was created as a nation. The United States was created as a nation yeah. when we beat the Indians. <laughs> well, we and, beat the British, don't forget. We and, deal and with the, the British, and, too. And the yeah. Spanish and, yeah. and, and South America and so yeah. on. Um, and, and South America, 
uh, nations have been created in, in, in the reasonably short period of time when you consider the, the history of our species. Mm -hmm. About 12, 15,000 years, yeah. I think. So, so nations emerge and they die out. Mm -hmm. And now today we see in, uh, India and especially China mm -hmm. emerging as a major force in the world. Yes. And uh, uh, even though they have over 130 languages. In China? In Is China. Is true? Yeah, OK. Um, it's still a nation. Ye and there are people who, who, who uh, for, uh, Taiwan was created, mm -hmm. one might say, and I would agree, artificially. Mm -hmm. And yet it's today a very active, very pro prosperous nation. So the whole idea of nationhood has been in, 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 uh, in, in it's been changing. It has. It yeah. has been changing. The nation state didn't emerge until, I guess, after the Enlightenment, Scottish yeah, Enlightenment, is when right. it started to emerge beyond feudalism yeah. and the systems we'd had of uh, feudal, you know, dynastic states, yeah. mm -hmm. changes. And what are we going to emerge to? We're going to emerge to one Some world kind of nation. united yeah. organization, mm -hmm. like the United Nations itself. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. What other institution is there that is rivaling that? You well, know? It's, it's going to be very, very complicated. That's one of the things I'm addressing mm -hmm. in my current writings oh, yeah. uh -huh. about how do we govern a society mm -hmm of such differences mm -hmm. uh, in, in the world. Well, uh, how does China govern 1.3 billion mm -hmm. people? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're having their problems. Oh, sure. Well, I, I think we have to develop, I think we have to develop a, a better human. And I think that when we're faced with uh, with the e extinction. Thank you. I think that ought to be emphasized in when, big letters all day to when, everybody. When people, and it never seems to be mentioned. When people realize that po that very possibility or even probability. I don't see it. Probability is scary, Joe. Yeah. I'm very worried. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. a lot of people are. Mm -hmm. I am one. I mean, what are our children and grandchildren going to do? What One kind thing, of a world are they going to get in? If we don't get our act together, as they say, there will be no children or grandchildren. That's the point, really. It's not like we can go and destroy, kill the other tribe, and win and steal their grain and do whatever, like we've been doing with calling it realpolitik or some interest of some small group yeah. over another. Exactly. You know, it's, it's a really different time to grow up Absolutely. in a very cosmic way. And that's why the kids are way, the way they are. You know, they wonder if they're going to have a job, a decent job, mm -hmm. a job that will use their potential, mm -hmm. uh, or whether they'll grow up at all. Do you think it is a job that they want? That's what Mr. Obama, he's trying, he's got some, he's got some class. It's good to have somebody with a sense of class at the helm. If speaking for myself on that, but they want to create jobs for everybody. But increasingly, it's the capital instruments that are responsible for production. And the capital is all owned by a tiny plutocratic class. And it seems to be with progressives, OK, that a small class owns everything, like kings used to do. And then the jobs, and Keynes warned that they're not, there's going to be massive technologically induced unemployment. And that's the only way we have to distribute any demand or buying power to the poor people, like peasants on a feudal estate, or serfs. And we're in a problem, the, the, the intellectual community, because they're also tied into the idea that the only way somebody's going to get money is to have a job. It's OK for the rich to just get richer as they get you know, asleep because they own assets. There's going to have to be a different economic theory informing the, this system. And, and the progressives don't seem to be having coming up with a system that William Shakespeare would be proud to say that we're hoisting it, if necessary, hoisting it on their own petard. Yes, indeed. Do you understand what I'm saying, Joe? Yes, we don't indeed. seem to have an alternative that's got legs, and, or uh, alternative in terms of a comprehensive understanding, 
such as the future now allows and perhaps requires, and we don't seem to have it. So it's the intellectuals that are falling down on the job, it would seem. Well, I don't think that's the case. I think that the power is so powerful. Yeah. Fox News, for example, yeah. is not news, it's propaganda, and it reaches an enormous number of people. The educational system is now being run by the big corporations, by and large. Right. And uh, uh, the scientific... As they run everything else. Yeah. yeah. So that's less than 2% of the population right. who have the power and the money. I talked to Ramsey Clark. You know Ramsey Clark? Yes, I you do. worked with Ramsey, Ramsey Clark? Yeah. Loved a man. He just lost his wife, I'm sorry to say. He lost his wife. She passed. Oh, I'm sorry. 48 years. She's a lovely lady. I'm really sorry because mm -hmm. he's done so well. But Sarah Flounders and the people who worked for him uh, said that uh, the concentration of the wealth is greater in this country than it was in 1789 France. That's right. And it's only growing. And we got this Republican Congress coming in. I don't know what the hell they got in their mind and everything. But there's no, uh, there's no, there's no challenging it somehow. Well, because we're caught up with this idea that you have to work. Maybe it isn't. The work is something. You've been working like demons, both of you. I'm speaking for myself too. Working like crazy had nothing to do with making money at all. In fact, it would be against making money. Is that you're working because that's what you believe in. So if people had an alternative way of having money, uh, I mean having income, then as a, as a national order, then it could free them to do what it is they want to do, like conduct an orchestra or build a great uh, social movement or something, rather than being slaves or like serfs to those who own everything. And it's okay for them to own everything even though, and that's where the production is taking place with cyber. You get an algorithm can displace 500,000 people, and you can't keep trying to get Lily Tomlin to plug in. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we don't have an alternative because we're tied up with the labor theory of value. I don't know. What do you think? We need some sort of an alternative to hoist the whole system on its own petard, and it's lacking. That I can see. Can you see something, or do we do we need such? To hoist the private property capitalist system on its own petard. Well, you're raising big questions. Yes, but we, it's time to raise big questions. It is indeed. You both gentlemen have been raising these big questions in your work over your whole lifetime, so well, why not I, throw it out here at the end of 2010? In my case, I'm yes, supporting sir. myself by treating patients. Uh huh, uh huh. And the work in the community was supplementary. Mm hmm. The work in the country was supplementary. Mm -hmm. So you had a profession on the side yeah, that yeah. gained income for right. you to meet your life's needs. That's the pattern we've had to cover. That's the pattern we've had. I don't think it's going to work. Lord Kane said there's going to be massive technological unemployment. And we got to we got to have some other way of distributing income. Well, you you have to I submit. You have to produce products. You don't have to overproduce. And you don't have the kind, don't need the kind of consumerism that we have in this country. Well, perhaps, Joel, you got to be careful with that. I mean, they got to have people with buying power or demand to clear the market. Of course, they have to be able to buy television sets, automobiles, radios, all kinds of good technology. They have to have the ability. The folks have to have the money to clear the market, supply and demand. There's no demand. They don't have a system of, of, of distributing demand or buying power to the people of the world. It's all becoming concentrated, and it's all becoming automated, and it's all becoming ownered, uh, owned by a few, and the left doesn't seem to have a way of challenging it. I don't know. Maybe I'm ranting, but do, do you don't feel that? I mean, it's the intellectuals falling. You don't expect a banker to be, uh, you know, magnanimous or anything, or a lion not to eat an antelope. You know, but the intellectuals who are thinking about these things are not coming up with an effective challenge to the overall system. Well, I think there are publications that you can read, like The Nation. Yeah, that's there. Which, which deals with these questions and sometimes has some answers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that we have to struggle and we have to study, educate ourselves and others mm -hmm. and raise some of these questions well, because they're not being raised on the main 
corporate media. It's not expected to be raised on the corporate media. They're not going to raise it or the political. It's the intellectuals. And the intellectuals are on the left. And the intellectuals on the left do not have a thing that is going to be able to hoist the system on its own petard with an adequate thing other than the idea that everybody's going to have a job. When the jobs are going to be eliminated, you have to have an alternative. What That's about, my contention. What about the cooperative movement? Cooperative. They had that in Spain, didn't they? Were you ever in Spain? Did you go fight in Spain in the 30s or anything with Hemingway? No, I'm, I'm just one. Spain had that cooperative, Madre Gore or something like that, where the ownership of the cooperative and the assets and everything are held by the people rather than by a small class. Yes. That, you yes. don't understand what I'm yeah. saying? Yes. That kind of thing. Yeah. But I don't see that. Anyway, it's a huge challenge. And uh, I'm of the opinion that we need a big change, a paradigm, a paradigm, a paradigm, a paradigm changes. And that uh, it's work like you that we've been able to uh, do. Well, I've I really learned some of those questions in my book. Yeah. Uh, uh, I raised some of those questions in the last couple of chapters of my book. Good. And the new book, or in violin? The, in violin, yeah. Einstein's violin. Yeah. And I'm going to proceed from there okay. in my new writings. Good, let's go. Yeah, and you too, sir, right? Huh? Are you, are you writing now or that? No? No, I'm um, considering. Okay, that's good. Mm -hmm. Considering and getting the ideas straight. You're, he's very active in terms of uh, looking at the world and paying attention to it and thinking about what needs to be done, which is part of the work of getting down what has to be done and getting it straight. And congratulations to you both enormously. You've been great inspirations to me and to the world, and I thank you very much for all your mighty efforts at improving the human condition. And we're grateful condition. to you. Well, we're all trying, aren't we, you know? And thank you, Harold. Oh, no, it's my pleasure to have you. And boy, that Ode to Joy was just gorgeous. Thank you sure know how to conduct an orchestra. It must be powerful. You must feel powerful when you conduct an orchestra. I, I feel a responsibility okay. to the musicians and to the orchestra and to the public. Okay, that's a well-crafted response. <laughs> you don't, you don't feel like a drill sergeant. <laughs> no, no, no. It's the, anything. It's really good. Thank you very much, and everything. And in the audience, welcome. Best of what's left of the holiday season. And uh, thank you for viewing. And gentlemen, once again, thank you for such well-led lives that continue to inspire us. And thank you. See you uh, tomorrow. So tune in then in the audience. And thank you for coming in. Thank Wait you. One second, we have to get to black, you guys. So we're going to take a minute or so. So it's so good to see Thank you. you. My pleasure. So good to see you, Harry. You're good looking to see great. You. Oh, yeah. so good. Mike, Don't forget Mike. to get your, your mic off. Oh, my mic off. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. There's still, wait a minute. But sit down, Joe. Sit down. Just be, maybe there's still running um, graphics going very slow. So let's get this on the tape. They may get this on the tape. Say something witty. Say something. Say something. They're, they still may be recording, and we'll put it up on the YouTube. Say something witty. We are recording Harry. another minute. Another minute. Well, Harold. Okay, say something. As the spokesperson for intellectuals. <laughs> yes. No, I'm cursing myself. You see, what are we going? How are we going to get out of this? It's like the, the the gang that can't shoot straight, or or the uh, what were the group that used to hit each other on the head? The, uh, what was that group with Mo and so forth? The, um, I forget who, the Marx Brothers, maybe. No, we're not done I yet, I have another Joe. appointment. Oh, yeah, please, another, please. He, has a, please. he can't, he has another appointment, he has to go. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you all. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Be careful, your mic, your mic, your mic. Okay, there you go.